Hi. In this lecture, I will um, attempt to establish something of a coherent and, um, and more comprehensive picture of technology, um, taking technology as our elephant, so to speak. Um, in other words, this kind of principal theme that we're attempting to approach from different, um, different aspects in order to, um, and yet with the understanding that uh, each of these aspects, though it is different, uh, they are still aspects of the same thing. And we saw um, a drawing on the parable of the blind man and the elephant from the first lecture. Um, we sort of uh, we've established that as a um, as a useful a useful way to inquire into a, a question that we don't already uh, a question for which we're not already presuming to know the answer. Um, that sort of uh, a way of establishing uh, conditions that are um, you know uh, conducive or um, conditions that foster achieving new insight into something, as opposed to just being able to rehash what we already know. Um, at the same time, we are attempting uh, to avoid falling into the fallacy of those blind men with the elephant. Uh, we're attempting to do that by um, always holding in our minds that, uh, again, there is some kind of unifying principle to all these uh, different aspects. And so just again to, uh, to repeat uh, this lecture, um, I'm, I'm attempting to do that with the theme of technology. Um, it's something that uh, that was introduced at the with the conclusion of the lecture immediately prior to this. Um, I introduced one uh, one facet or one aspect of technology. Um, in this lecture, I will uh, introduce uh, a second one, and that will serve as the kind of uh, the kind of primary or the, the body of this lecture will be an attempt to explore um, and and sort of explicate what is um, contained within. Uh, this second aspect that I will introduce. And then also then to conclude the lecture, I'll, uh, I'll also set one uh, final aspect of technology before us. And so we, uh, through these uh, sort of three aspects of technology, uh, the one as a uh, continuation from the prior lecture, and the last one actually to serve as a uh, kind of uh, a, a gateway or uh, an entry point into uh, our theme for next week, um, which will be uh, uh, an exploration of um, Rudolf Steiner's theory of cognition and uh, how we how we perceive and how we make sense of the world. Um, that will be something that we take up in greater um, greater focus uh, next week. Uh, but so today, again, my um, what I hope to achieve is uh, to kind of array before us a, a comprehensive and also uh, in depth. So not just a superficial view of technology, but really trying to inquire into the the essence of technology. What makes uh, technology technology? Um, and so, just to recapitulate from the last lecture, one, uh, one element of technology, I suggested it has to do with uh, the way in which the technology is a, kind of, it's a kind of casting off or outsourcing of capacities that are latent in human beings. Uh, it's a way of externalizing those capacities, uh, making them objective before us, uh, and at the same time, magnifying them or intensifying them. Uh, the example from last week that was introduced through the myth of, of Thoth and the, the myth of, uh, of, of this god who conferred the art of writing onto human beings. Uh, this depicted a way in which the capacity for uh, memory, so to, to remember knowledge and to remember stories, this capacity was in some ways um, extrojected, cast out, and uh, externalized from the human being and placed uh, onto the paper through uh, pen and ink. Um, as I was, uh, just over the last couple of days, this theme has been on my mind, and, and I stumbled upon a, a quote from, uh, it's an anonymous quote from, uh, Chinese, uh, from the Chinese tradition. Uh, the quote goes something like, uh, the, the faintest ink uh, can outdo the greatest memory. So the most powerful memory, uh, it's still not, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not as effective as even the faintest ink. And again, the, uh, this, this emphasizes the, the way in which technology uh, it both outsources capacities, but it also um, it augments them and magnifies them. Um, and uh, the one, one, something that the, the myth of, uh, of Thoth, as, uh, as Plato depicted it in the Phaedrus, um, this is again uh, so somewhat by way of, of recapitulation from the last lecture. Uh, Plato actually emphasizes the, the way in which uh, by outsourcing those capacities, we are also uh, at the same time 
um, almost uh, basically by once we cease to uh, to for, to take memory for for an example, uh, once once we have no imperative to remember anymore, when we stop using our memories, we also cease to be able to use them. And I think uh, such a telling example is, is uh, the only phone numbers that I remember are from uh, from childhood friends, uh, you know, years and years and years ago. Uh, today I have no need, and I think this goes for most people. We have no need uh, to remember something like a phone number because because we've outsourced that kind of uh, intelligence um, uh, onto our smartphones, and so our, our smartphones sort of uh, carry uh, carry some of the smartness for us. Um, Again, uh, this is not to say that uh, it's uh, entirely, uh, well, it's not, it's not a good or a bad thing in itself. It seems to be a fact. Like technology um, doesn't really make sense to, uh, to question. Again, technology is a fact, so uh, it's, it's basically up to us to, to uh, determine how we make use of this fact. Um, also, the, it seems to be a ca the case that uh, the you know, advancement and development of technology is also a fact, and so this is just the world that we find ourselves in. So I think part of this exploration to technology always has to imply, at the same time, not just technology in itself, but, but our relation to technology in a kind of ethical sense. Um, but so again, the, the risk of outsourcing these capacities is, th is that we, we become dependent on them. Um, another example is uh, the way that if we, um, you know, before, imagine all of the creatures of nature, they, they thermoregulate. Uh, through all the seasons, they uh, are able to maintain a, you know, more or less consistent body temperature. Um, but then, with the advent of fire, beginning with fire, just uh, you know, uh, elemental fire, uh, and then though continuing to something like um, you know, uh, wearing clothes, uh, and then also and now you know today central heating, these are all uh, kind of steps along a process of again outsourcing this ability of thermoregulation. Uh, into some kind of uh, technological means, uh, and then, uh, and then, but it's very clear at the same time we uh, we are by outsourcing it, we're uh, in some ways again depriving ourselves of the inherent capacity to thermoregulate, and so it's much harder for a modern person, a modern person, to um, you know subsist out in the elements than it would have been for for an ancient person. And so I hope this is, is you know provides somewhat of a, a comprehensive picture to one one uh, face of technology, so to speak. So uh, in tech again, I'm go going to try to, uh, over the course of this lecture, try to place before us uh, three faces of technology. And so uh, that was the first one. Um, the second one is, um, it has to do with technology as a means, um, technology as a process, uh, technology as, a, uh, as an efficiency. Uh, in, in other words, technology as a way to a uh, means to accomplish a certain end. Um, this is distinguishing uh, the means from the end itself. Uh, to put it in Greek, it's a way of distinguishing techne from telos, which would be the end, uh, and also techne from uh, so technics from ethics, uh, techne from ethike. Uh, this would be a sort of distinction between um, technology as in itself neither good uh, nor bad. Uh, o rather, it's only a means of uh, of achieving an aim that it that the aim itself could be good or bad in an ethical sense. Uh, technology itself has nothing to say about that. It only um, it only uh, increases the expediency. Or it gives us expediency by which to accomplish um, it's w you know one or another aim. And so uh, it's a way of so another way of thinking of it would be in this second facet of ethics. Um, the first way was kind of uh, magnifying or, or outsourcing or intensifying um, capacities that we have, memory, for example. But we could also think of the capacity for locomotion, and it's intensified through having um, a wagon, and then, a, uh, and then uh, obviously a, a, a truck <laughs> uh, or an airplane. Um, now, in the second, the, again, the second phase of technology, this would be ways, uh, means of intensifying, um, not so much capacities, but uh, or magnifying, not so much capacities, but magnifying uh, intentions. So when we have a wish or an intention to accomplish something, so we ha have a, a given aim or a given end in mind, then we um, we can use technology as a means to more efficiently, more effectively. 
um, basically to close the distance, uh, to close the gap between uh, ourselves and that outcome. Um, another way of thinking about this, uh, this second facet of technology, uh, you can think of it as both, uh, it, it, it overcomes uh, distance in respect to space. Um, we can think of this as, uh, you know, whatever is my reach, my arm span, uh, if I have a stick, I've extended my arm span by the length of that stick. So whatever is my arm span without the stick, it's greater with the stick. Uh, and again, so that's a way of, um, of, of magnifying or augmenting an intention that I have that's expressed through my reach. Um, is that uh, the same, uh, you know, by an orders, orders of magnitude greater if I have, um, for example, to, uh, to move from a, a, you know, an empty hand, the reach of an empty hand to the reach of a hand with a stick in it to the reach of, um, like if I have a if I have a a, uh, a robot to do my bidding or a drone, uh, 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 a drone that that I can program to, to do my bidding. Again, this is uh, just ways of uh, in which I've again increased and augmented my ability to uh, carry out an intention. So this is overcoming space. Uh, in the same way, um, you know, in a very similar way, and maybe in the same way, it, it technology uh, overcomes time. Uh, you know, so spatial distance, it overcomes, it also overcomes temporal distance. And this is all kind of implicit in the notion of efficiency. Um, but if you just, uh, again, technology, it's, it's ways of increasing our efficiency to accomplish something without saying anything about those things that we're accomplishing, in the first case anyway. To go back to the example of, of uh, going somewhere by foot compared to going somewhere with a, a wagon, compared to just uh, suppose that I uh, go wish to travel to um, San Francisco or uh, Sao Paulo or um, Buenos Aires. In any one of those cases, uh, it'll take me a certain period of time to travel that distance on foot. It will take me less time if I can ride a dog sled or a wagon or something. It will take me still less time if I can, uh, just to get uh, to Buenos Aires, if I could drive a truck, for example. Um, it will take me still even less time, and I maybe could get there by this time tomorrow if I set out right now to Buenos Aires if I could fly in an airplane. These are all different ways in which, the again, the distance in time has been almost telescoped uh, with technology, and uh, so this is a way of, you know, it's both overcoming space and also time. So, you know, uh, space and time, um, well, space divides us from, uh, from, from other places or uh, goals, destinations, space divides us from our destination, uh, time divides us from, from events in the future, okay, but in both of the, but whatever is the distance without technology, it's much smaller with technology. So again, this is a way in which technology, uh, it over, uh, there's a, you know, uh, something has to happen, a process has to unfold. Technology makes that process, um, it expedites that process, it makes the process faster. Um, I would like to, uh, uh, having established that as a s sort of the you know the first uh, the first uh, picture or the first glimpse at this second face of technology, I would like to try to uh, deepen our exploration of the second face, and I would like to make use of a, a myth uh, as a kind of standard procedure by now making use of these myths to reveal and inquire into aspects of, of questions that we might have otherwise just sort of assumed that we had already understood everything there was to understand about it. Um, this myth is uh, the myth of Prometheus, and it's basically the, um, uh, s the it, it tells the story of Prometheus stealing fire from the gods and conferring it onto human beings. Before I uh, just briefly recount this myth, I think it is worth just pausing and in some ways as a kind of excursus, inquiring a little bit into the notion of myth or the, you know, the, the essence of myth itself. Uh, in somewhat similar way to the, the way we've been doing about technology. Um, you know, some that we just the fact that we could use a word in a sentence, like we could use myth in a sentence, and the sentence would be intelligible to people. Often we sort of, uh, in terms of trying to understand something, we are content with being able to use a word in a sentence, and I think we know what it means. Um, but as I think will be clear by now uh, through this, uh, you know, this uh, course on critical thinking, um, there's a lot, there's often, you know, if we're willing to inquire deeper into something, we will almost never be disappointed. And I think uh, myth gives us a perfect opportunity to do that. If we think about uh, what we understand by myth, um, some, something of a kind of like an initial 
a way in which myth is often used is to contrast it with what implies that something is false, that it's not true. Um, it's clear, uh, you know, that bears some kind of connection to, to what myth means essentially, but I, I also think it should be just as clear that that doesn't, uh, that doesn't encompass or it doesn't exhaust what a myth can mean. And, uh, you know, to really inquire into uh, the, the meaning and the, the essence and the nature of myth, we'd have to go back, uh, you know, kind of hearkening back to the, the, the myth that, or the, the myth and the scene that Plato gave of, of a god conferring writing to human beings. We have to almost cast ourselves back in our imagination, historical imagination, and, and think of a time um, before, before writing, so before this event that Plato had described in kind of mythic imagery. Um, how was knowledge and stories, how were these, how were these things um, communicated before uh, they could be written down. And it's amazing just to kind of uh, try to invoke this scene before our imaginations. We will see something like, um, you know, a, a poet or a bard, a prophet, um, somebody like, like Homer, for example. Uh, you know, imagine after, after a day's work and, and, and a community would, would gather around the bard to hear you know, these, these epics recounted, the, the deeds and sufferings of the immortal gods. Uh, these, these are not something that the, that the people would have the understanding that they couldn't just go and, and read about these things in a library somewhere. Again, we're imagining a time before, before libraries existed, certainly before writing existed. I don't know what you would have in a library without uh, having books in there. This, rather, whatever we, we can receive from, well, from uh, the Oracle Google now or from a library today, uh, at that time, the only, like, sort of the way in which the doorway, the gateway through which that kind of, those stories and that knowledge and that wisdom entered into uh, human, the human's life, uh, human lives, was uh, through the mouth of a, of a, the, the, the bard was a mouthpiece of this knowledge. It's like that was the entry point, that was the, the source or the wellspring, the font of this kind of knowledge. And you imagine a, a sort of, you know, a, a, a human being suddenly kind of um, almost being kindled or uh, inspired by these, uh, by these stories and then beginning to recount the, the, you know, the, the stories like, like as contained in, the, in the, the Odyssey and the Iliad, for example. And um, it's quite a powerful scene, this kind of the, the, a, a single person kind of lighting up with these, uh, these powerful stories. Um, and, and then it's clear also that, that uh, you know, hearing about these stories they would those uh, the same you know that experience of, of hearing about the stories, it's it, it it lends a kind of coherence to all of the phenomena that you perceive uh, in your ordinary life. Um, in some way, what we see with our eyes are just uh, different things, like one thing after the next. Um, the myths they would weave all of those individual things almost like um, like beads into a tapestry the myth would weave all of the individual things together to uh, lend a sort of coherence to uh, the world that confronts us through our senses rather than a chaos. Um, in some way, it's, um, it's weaving a cosmos out of chaos. Uh, those words, the Greek word cosmos, it basically just means something ordered, something intelligible. It contrasts to chaos, something uh, that's just unintelligible. There's no d uh, perceptible order to it. The myths, in some way, they're structuring chaos and turning it into something a cosmos, something that is perceptible. The uh, just for example, something you know, kind of simplistic almost, but I think it will serve to convey convey it with that stake here. Um, many people may be familiar with the myth of, of Persephone, and the idea is that in the in the um, in the in the autumn, she's ac she's actually and she spends half the year. She's in the autumn. She's abducted uh, abducted into the underworld by Pluto. Uh, and so she spends half of the year uh, in the underworld with Pluto or Hades. And her mother, Demeter, who is the kind of goddess of, of the harvest and the, the goddess of fertility, um, she's the goddess that, that makes the flowers to grow. The loss of her daughter, uh, it's, uh, she mourns, Demeter mourns the loss of Persephone, and she becomes sullen, and she refuses to, uh, you know, kind of fertilize the earth and draw the flowers up. And so we have half of the year in which the flowers, they just kind of wither, and all of the uh, flora uh, just droops. Um, then in the spring, Persephone returns, and 
Demeter, her mother, rejoices at the return of, of her daughter. And, uh, and so she becomes inspired to, uh, again, draw the flowers up, uh, you know, and create the blossom. And, uh, you know, in one way, you might just see, you might see something happen, and then the next thing happen. Um, and you might, but to have this story behind it, it suddenly, it weaves, you know, these, uh, these events that you just perceive with your senses, it weaves them into a, a, a coherent narrative. And suddenly, you know, the end is related to the beginning in a way that otherwise it, it wouldn't be end or beginning. It would just be two different events. Scientific theories serve very much the same purpose today. And, and the reason we uh, often, it's, it's unusual for uh, scientific theories to be compared with myths, I think, to say the least. They seem like sep totally separate things, like science is about knowledge and myth is about fantasy. I think the way, uh, I think that's something of a, uh, a simplistic conclusion, though, and I think uh, at least one way in which they're related is that both of them serve this purpose of uh, identifying and, and, you know, establishing order amongst apparently um, unrelated phenomena. It establishes relationships amongst those phenomena that, that otherwise, without those either scientific theories on one hand and myth on the other hand, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to perceive relations between things. They would just seem totally separate. Um, a, a perfect example, it's kind of the, the, an iconic example, is the way that Newton, uh, Isaac Newton, the scientist, was able to, uh, you know, through his formulation of the, the laws of motion and, and, and uh, the laws of gravitation, he was able to uh, relate uh, something uh, like the falling of an apple from a, from a tree to the revolution of planets, uh, discerning the same principle operative in both of those things, which uh, to the senses, per, you know, perceptibly to the senses, couldn't appear more different and further apart. Um, again, this is a way of uh, establishing coherence and connection and relation between two things that otherwise would seem totally separate. Uh, the myths do something very similar. Um, and so I guess this, this excursus on myth, I thought it was, it was worth just, uh, just taking this, this um, you know, something of a detour, and a, a maybe it's a tangent, but I also think it's, it's important just to um, establish uh, just kind of the nature of myths. Like, what is at stake when we're talking about myth? Um, and so now, now I will proceed to uh, just you know briefly offer a, uh, briefly recount and offer a summary of this myth of uh, Prometheus stealing fire from the gods. Um, but we can have in the back of our minds, um, you know, again this sort of open question of what does this myth allow us? What diverse phenomena does this myth allow us to perceive? Uh, insights and connections between insights into and connections between the myth is basically um, and like every story it's you know wherever you wherever you begin a story and wherever you end the story uh, it's obvious that there's a beginning before the beginning or there's something that happens before the beginning uh, in a similar way there's something that continues after the end and so in some ways I'm just uh, almost again imagining the myth as a tapestry that's all woven together and connected I'm kind of uh, more or less, um, more or less arbitrarily. I'm, I'm just uh, drawing off uh, one piece, and you know, almost kind of uh, cutting off one piece out of the tapestry to just focus on that piece, but uh, with the understanding that it's uh, it uh, again something. There's a context to it on both sides. Um, but the the myth basically begins with um, just following what is called the Titanomachy, and it's basically the the event in which the Olympian the generation of gods called the Olympians, the, the Greek gods, they, uh, the Olympians have just, um, have, have just overcome in a, in a battle, they've just overcome and vanquished the Titans, which was the generation of gods uh, that Im was immediately, uh, immediately uh, prior to and immediately elder to the Olympians. So the Titans are one generation of gods, the Olympians are the next generation. Um, the, the king of the Titans was uh, Saturn Kronos. Um, uh, the, the 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 father uh, the king of the um, the king of the Olympians is uh, is Jupiter Zeus, and so Jupiter Zeus uh, has just succeeded in leading the Olympians to uh, vanquish Titan, and so the Olympians are the new Zeus is the regent of the Olympians, and the Olympians have uh, just as, uh, you know ascended to a sort of um, hegemony over the world, and so it's their task to kind of um, reestablish a kind of order, uh, you know, because it's everything has kind of been thrown into an upheaval on the brink of chaos and so uh you know zeus as the as the regent here is 
uh, it's kind of his responsibility to reestablish a cosmos out of the chaos. And one way he does that is by delegating uh, different tasks to different, uh, different personages, different uh, immortal uh, gods. And, he, uh, and among, among other tasks, he charges these two brothers who actually happen to be titans, so they belong to the generation above Zeus, but these two gods were somehow, or these two titans were sympathetic with the Olympians in this battle against the titans. And so Zeus, uh, so Zeus looks on them, on them as friends, and so he, uh, he kind of welcomes them into the new order. He basically gives these two brothers the task of um, uh, kind of creating and, and forming the, um, the various creatures and animals, including the human beings. And uh, so this is Prometheus and Epimetheus. Uh, uh, it's probably worth just investigating or, or just kind of commenting on the, the, the names of those two brothers. And uh, as often as, the, as is often the case in a myth, um, the names themselves kind of, uh, the names carry part of the story. And if we think about the name uh, Prometheus uh, in contrast to Epimetheus, there's a root of these two names that they share, it's Metheus. And in Greek, this word has something to do with thought or uh, cleverness or prudence. Um, then, but they have different uh, inflections on that principle of, of thought or prudence. And those inflections are indicated by the different prefixes, so pro compared to epi. And just to give a picture, if we imagine thought as a kind of uh, sphere or a box, um, pro would indicate uh, two or with, or together with, or even inside of. Um, and so the idea of Prometheus is like, uh, this brother is uh, with thought, um, or towards thought, or inside of thought. Epi, by contrast, would mean something like um, around, or about, or outside of, or peripheral to. So Epimetheus is outside of thought. And I think the, the meaning of these names, or the, the pertinence of these names, will become clear uh, by the myth, because um, the two brothers decide that between them, Prometheus will, uh, he, he will take the task of kind of forging the human being out of clay. Um, Epimetheus, by contrast, will, uh, he will take the bag of, uh, Zeus had kind of given these two brothers a bag or a sack full of uh, various endowments. Um, for instance, uh, you know, like claws and teeth and stings and scales and wings and, and just all of the, the, the diversity of animals, all of their features that you know, help, them, help them to make a way for themselves in the world. And Prometheus uh, is going to form the human being. Epimetheus is going to distribute those gifts among the different creatures. And each of them sets about their work. Uh, the idea is that Prometheus will go and do these creatures. Uh, Epimetheus afterwards will, will inspect. But in the meantime, he's going to concern himself with uh, creating the human being, forming the human being out of clay. They each go about their business. Uh, Epimetheus, though, uh, he's kind of a little bit absent-minded, and he, he realizes uh, he, he's just giving out gifts, you know, more or less, uh, like pretty, uh, pretty uh, generously. And he, but he realizes he comes to the bottom of the sack, and he realizes he gave out the last gift, and it's empty. He comes back, Prometheus, with an empty sack. And the, in, in other words, the implication is there's nothing left for the human being. And so here is this, uh, you know, Prometheus has formed this kind of um, uh, you know, featherless biped, basically, with nothing, uh, nothing to speak for it, and no, uh, no natural gift. Uh, you know, no sting, no claws, no, uh, no tail, no feathers, no anything. And, um, and so Prometheus, but but Prometheus, you know, he feels kind of responsible to, for this 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 poor being on the earth who, uh, you know, won't make it in a, in the kind of you know the the, the dog eat dog vicious. Uh, world of nature, and so um, and so Prometheus resolves actually to to defy Zeus's orders. Uh, he's going to um, he's going to contradict the the um, the regent of the gods, and he's, he's so so. What Prometheus does is he ascends to Mount Olympus and he steals fire from the temple of the gods, and he brings the fire back and he gives it to human beings. Um, this is the idea of again stealing fire from the gods and uh, giving it to the human beings. One, uh, I'll just make one more comment, and then that's probably a good place to end the myth. Um, it keeps going on. Obviously, it, it ends actually it, immediately afterwards. Uh, um, Zeus, uh, Zeus discovers what happened, and uh, the next part of the myth is when uh, Zeus kind of he seeks retribution uh, for what Prometheus did, and, and he does that two ways. One of them is by sending uh, sending a box 
full of uh, basically it's it's full of all kinds of strife like you know despair and, and, and hopelessness and war and famine and and plague um, and uh, and he sends it uh, he, he's uh, Pandora is the one who, who brings the, the box and um, again I'm not going to go into all of this but just just to show how it relates to the rest of the myths uh, Prometheus himself is punished by Zeus he's chained to a mountain in the Caucasus and uh, every every day an eagle eats out his liver from his side uh, as he's chained to the chained to the, the mountain uh, every night the, the liver uh, regenerates and so it just happens eternally eternal recurrence over and over again and this just goes on for, for eons until uh, the hero Hercules finally frees Prometheus from the mountain in one of uh, his famous, one of Hercules' famous uh, labors. But just returning to this uh, scene in which Prometheus uh, ascends the Mount, Mount Olympus and steals fire from the temple of the gods and brings it to human beings, uh, there's a kind of, um, there's an apocryphal uh, story of the myth that, that, in fact, actually Plato, Plato says this, and this uh, this myth is most fully, among Plato's dialogues, it's most fully recounted in the Protagoras dialogue. Plato makes the comment that one, uh, what, what Prometheus did not steal from the gods was uh, something translated as political wisdom. And it's, uh, it's um, the idea of uh, basically being able to uh, or organize uh, groups of people in a way that's harmonious, in the proper way. And so he says, like, people just don't have that ability. And, and the reason that, he, that Prometheus couldn't get to that one is because Zeus guarded that one more carefully. Um, uh, fire was, was in the temple of Athena and Hephaestus, actually, the, the kind of uh, blacksmith of the gods. And, um, but, but Zeus kept this uh, special wisdom in his own temple and guarded it specially. And, and this was just um, Prometheus couldn't risk stealing that. And so uh, human beings are uh, with fire but in some ways kind of without the wisdom to uh, to order the fire towards proper ends is a, a picture we can be left with. Um, I hope that uh, that picture from the myth, um, I hope that it's a little bit clearer what that might mean um, uh, by the end of this video. Because returning to fire, we have this question of, um, as always is the, in the case of a parable or a myth, we've ha asked the same question since the very beginning, like what are these, what are these stories depicting um, where should we should we try where should we look for Plato's cave if we're trying to uh, uncover Plato's cave do we go and search around the countryside in Greece or is that maybe the wrong way to go about this and I think we can think of uh, the myth of all myths but including this one uh, in a similar way it's like do we imagine Mount Olympus as the mountain in Greece or do we think of it as something uh, something that is um, that's being used as a symbol uh, to kind of depict and lend uh, imaginal or uh, yeah imaginal or pictorial body to something that uh, in principle doesn't have a shape or doesn't have a, a look and I'm uh, as probably will be clear by now I'm always encouraging us to think in the the second way um, mostly because uh, because that uh, that's the most fru uh, that's that's the most conducive of uh, achieving new insights, and so rather than setting those two things up as exclusive, um, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Um, the second one is something that we can we can accomplish with our own means here, and it's it's proven, it's shown itself to um, again kind of foster the conditions that it can allow us to perceive new new aspects to things and new dimensions to things, and so I will encourage us to think about stealing fire from the gods not as something that happened a long time ago or somewhere uh, in a different part of the world, uh, but rather uh, try, to, uh, try to pose the question and hold open the question, like what, uh, what principles is this trying to depict through the form of stories and images and s uh, different scenes? One way to think about this, and this is where I will try to tie this myth back to uh, what I call the, the second face of technology, which is, uh, you know, again, just to just to repeat, uh, recapitulate something from uh, a few minutes ago, the idea of technology as um, as the the means of uh, of overcoming the distance between uh, the beginning and the goal of something. So overcoming the the distance between um, my intention and the result or the destination of my intention. Technology shortens that. So there's a process, and then there's a, an end or a product. Technology is always uh, shortening the process, making the process go faster and faster and faster. 
Uh, so technology as efficiency. Um, now, if we think about fire and the symbol of fire, this can present an immediate connection because fire itself, if we think about it like this, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm always reminded of this uh, a single quote that I found memorable from reading the philosopher Hegel. And the quote is something like, like fire is materialized time. And the first time I read it, it was so uh, striking and enigmatic. And I thought, what is he talking about? Um, and uh, then reflecting upon it, I, uh, I've come to, to see it as though, um, you know, ordinarily we think of time as something, uh, we, don't, we don't see time with our eyes. We see things with our eyes and then we, f we infer time. Uh, and, you know, time, there's a, a metaphor of, a, you know, time is like a river, for example. Um, now, this is very similar, very analogous to the way, that the way I tried to uh, present myths. Uh, time itself doesn't have a shape, but we compare it to a river, and in that way we give it a shape, and by giving it a shape, we're able to, uh, it helps us to perceive or to discern an aspect of time that otherwise might just be something abstract. Um, in a similar way, we can think of fire, uh, we can think of, uh, if we think of uh, fire as almost a, a way in which um, the, the, uh, the, the invisible world so the world of, of uh, things without shapes, and again, this sounds uh, kind of mystical until we, we think about it and we realize so many things don't have shapes. Time doesn't have a shape. Um, uh, again, you know, concepts don't have shapes. The number three doesn't have a shape. Um, if we think of fire as a way in which uh, time actually uh, comes close to achieving a sense, you know, time almost becomes perceptible to the senses in a way that ordinarily time is not. So fire, again, it's a materialization, and material just meaning referring to something that is perceptible through the senses. Our, our senses are, you know, with our senses we perceive uh, material things, uh, and we don't perceive immaterial things. That's almost contained in the definition of those words. Fire, though, it's a kind of, it's a border, it's a, it's a kind of boundary condition in which uh, time, and, and th think about time, really, uh, it's time itself, it's not at all clear and I think the reason we think of time as something separate from change, we think of you know, time almost like the container of change or the container of transformation. Um, I think, though, if we reflect on it a little bit, uh, we can't actually think of one of those separate from the other one. Like, it's not clear that you could think about time except in respect to something that's changing. And the reason I don't think that's clear is because I don't, I don't know how you would measure the time or mark the time, or, you know, the time would not be intelligible except uh, in virtue of whatever is transforming over the, that period of time. I mean, in a similar way, I, I don't. I think it, it's almost a contradiction in terms to imagine something changing without time passing. Uh, in some way, those two things we have different words for them. Um, in a way, it's like thunder and lightning, and in, uh, in some sense, they're they're kind of the same phenomenon, but just one is perceived through our eyes, and the other is perceived through our um, through our ears. Uh, so, in a similar way. Um, you know, like time and transformation, they're kind of the same thing, uh, but we have two different words, and that those words emphasize different, different faces of uh, this single thing. And then, if we imagine fire as a kind of intensification or condensation uh, of of transformation itself, uh, this is clear. Any any time something is on fire, uh, what's happening is a again an intensive transformation. Um, then I think we can start to see the connection between technology and fire um, and time transformation. Uh, the way in which, again, technology, it, it's a kind of intensification or a, a, it, it expedites um, any kind of process, any kind of, uh, again, change or uh, change from one thing to another, movement from one thing to another. Um, uh, and then, then, I mean, then we have to ask the question, if, if we just kind of establish that or, or pr uh, posit that as a, as a hypothesis or a theory, and we just uh, see what, what that reveals, we will then have to ask the question, um, what does it mean that, that, uh, you know, that fire once belonged to the gods, but then it was stolen and given to human beings? And there, you know, there are a thousand ways to, to, uh, to inquire into that, um, you know, into that, that, that question. Uh, one of the ways, though, is to think about it in terms of, again, like, when we think of gods, we're, we're in some ways talking about those principles that served to um, structure and organize uh, the processes of, of transformation in nature. 
So, um, you know, the way a fruit ripens on a tree, this is clearly, uh, you know, it's, it's a fire process, really. It's nothing other than that. Uh, the, the, the fruit is slowly being cooked uh, in the sun. Yeah. And in some ways, uh, you know, it's not too much of a stretch. Once we recognize, if we can see the fire in the fruit, the fire in the process of ripening fruit, um, it's not too much of a stretch to see fire everywhere. Um, everything is, uh, everything is uh, in some ways just a, a process of transformation that's been arrested or kind of slowed down to the point of appearing to be stable. But, you know, uh, you wait long enough and everything will change. And so it's clear that everything is a kind of, again, like a uh, frozen, fire that's been frozen or um, almost like bound up or enchanted, like drawn together. Um, and, and, you know, this is, there's, again, uh, with these ideas, one, by contrast, when we think of like physical objects, in principle, they are, um, they're, they're separate, they're not coextensive. There's a reversal that happens if we start thinking about uh, meanings ideas um, because everything in principle is coextensive with everything else like there's no there's no obvious you know if you really understood one single thing um, and this goes back to Plato you would uh, you would in principle kind of understand everything um, if we think about uh, if we think about the, f the process of fire as kind of again like a transformation or a you know uh, what we what we call objects, they're in some ways like a um, like fire that's been uh, that's been bound up or almost um, again like frozen frozen fire. It's been it's fire that's been enchanted into a fixed form, but it's still but it's uh, it, it, you know it's it's like the energy of transformation that's been that's been uh, 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 frozen. Uh, we s we we can also almost see the inverse of that process in what we think of as photosynthesis the plants are accomplishing, you know, all through the summer months, they are kind of, uh, again, taking this, uh, you know, f fire from the sun, the energy of transformation from the sun, and they are uh, binding it or enchanting it into, um, like, freezing it, condensing it. Um, and, you know, like, uh, fi uh, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, contemporary notions of physics. They, they don't contradict this at all. They're just, uh, they're different ways of thinking about it. Um, this, the, you know, the Einstein's famous, um, famous equivalence or, or proportionality between uh, energy and m matter. So, uh, this, you know, the, the famous equation, uh, energy is uh, mass uh, times the universal constant squared. This, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's communicating the same principle. That's uh, this kind of equivalence or proportionality or transformation between matter and energy on the two sides. Um, it's clear that in the one case, in photosynthesis, uh, you know, energy is being converted into matter. Uh, in, in the fire process, it's uh, you know the the opposite is happening. Uh, the you know the, the scales have tipped towards the towards the liberation of that same energy that was once enchanted. Now again, if we think about the gods, uh, they uh, in the ancient times, you know, before Prometheus stole the fire, the gods had ordered those processes of transformation in in nature. Uh, then suddenly human beings gain access to that ability to to structure and order those same processes of fire. And I think this, um, you know, this is not at all a stretch for us today, I think, with our imaginations to see the way in which the human being's ability to, again, basically, um, you know, restructure and reorder the processes of nature for our own... Um, I'm, I'm hesitant to say benefit, and that's just because it's not clear whether uh, when we try to achieve something that, that whatever that end or that goal that we have in mind, it's not clear whether it's, it's for our benefit or not. Like, you know, that's a separate question from our ability to achieve that same end with greater efficiency. And that's what we've been able to do uh, with fire, is to become, uh, again, more and more efficient at, um, you know, restructuring those processes uh, in, in nature and you know, basically wielding them to our designs. And whether those designs are uh, good or not, again, uh, that's a separate question. Um, and you know, it's, it's just, uh, again, I don't think it, it, it's too much of a stretch for us today, today to see um, you know, these things, the way in which they're related. Like, um, we have a feeling today that, that, that people might have kind of overstepped some, some sort of natural equilibrium. And you know, 
kind of allowed the fire process to get out of hand. And we have concern about, uh, you know, well, you know, fires in forest fires, and and also a sense that um, in some way the fire process of the whole earth has been a little bit skewed, and you know, people are concerned about the way in which the climate is changing, and and, and you know the temperature is changing. Um, these things, they they in some way they seem like a thousand. It's like a like a hodgepodge or a, a, a smorgasbord of a thousand different things that I've kind of lumped together here, uh, uh, but I think they share this principle. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's, it's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a meaning or a principle that's, that's latent in the notion and the idea of technology itself. Again, technology as a way to um, reorganize or restructure uh, processes in nature and bend them to our designs, make them more efficient. So make these processes happen faster with greater efficiency. Uh, and then, and again, I think fire is a symbol of that. Um, we want to say, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to be able to use the word fire in a sentence. It's another thing to say, like, what does fire mean? Um, and that's the question that we'll always be exploring in, in myths. And also, that's kind of the critical approach. Um, the naive approach would be to already assume that we know something, and the critical approach is to um, kind of assume that we don't and, you know, pose a question, like, uh, what does this mean? And then, um, you know, try to try to explore the question. That's probably uh, a good place. Um, I guess there's there's one more comment that I would just make, and, and rather than this will be more as a an invitation uh, to think further on this. Um, and so rather than than you know really trying to detail it in this lecture, I would just kind of propose this theory, and and then encourage anyone uh, who wishes to to uh, you know pursue it, and and, and I'm uh, happy to uh, entertain uh, discussions about it in a different forum. Um, the idea of technology as, as the ability to, and fire, as the ability to, um, that human beings have that uh, differentiates them from all other um, creatures, and that is the ability to, you know, one, one, um, one place that, one obvious uh, kind of focus or locus um, of a fire process is um, in metabolism, and so physiology. Physi physiology is a very obviously and clearly, you know, if we talk about the, the way the gods have structured the fire processes, um, the physiology of an organism is like, it's kind of perhaps the most exquisite and carefully, um, ex exquisitely orchestrated um, structure of fire processes. Again, process of transformation, transformation of substance. Um, our bodies are, you know, continually transforming substances in that way. And all other creatures uh, have 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 that, you know, to some metabolism to some degree. That's what, in some way, it's contained in the definition of creature. Um, that's it's implied. It's almost like a it's a tautology to say to say that like every creature has physiology. Um, but one thing that you know one. Again, one, one theory or one, one way of looking at technology is to think of it in the way that no other creature can do this, which is to make use of energy sources external to um, metabolism or to food. Uh, human beings can do that. Uh, you know, beginning with, um, I mean, the obvious example is, is like, um, like oil or something yeah, and, and electricity. So these ways of, again, kind of uh, being able to manipulate or restructure um, processes of nature uh, that otherwise are kind of already already ordered according to the you know the work of the gods um, and I think you know this is just a very very strict uh, it's human beings are very strictly delineated from other creatures in that sense of being able to make use of, of energy sources that are external to the organism's own metabolism um, and so, so this finally could be another way of, of thinking about stealing fire from the gods. And, and then if you had to answer the question like, okay, well, where is Mount Olympus? Um, it's clear that if you were looking for Mount Olympus, um, you know, out there somewhere, you would be looking in the wrong direction. And in some way, it's like the fire has been stolen from kind of like inside of ourselves and, and, and inside of all living things. And 
that's where the gods live, is in the living things, and it's been uh, basically given into our hands uh, to make use of outside in the world. Um, that I just, again, uh, I just put that before us as a, an invitation to think further about it, and um, I'd be happy to, to uh, take up uh, further discussion or dialogue about it. Um, but I think this is a good place to, uh, you know, just kind of transition into the, the third face of technology, and, and as I mentioned, this will be something that kind of, I hope that it can provide a good segue into our next theme. Um, the third way of technology, um, and it, so again, this won't be totally separate from what we've covered already, but, uh, but it is, um, it does give a different, again, a different face or a different aspect of technology. That's the way in which technology, um, so at the same time as we are, um, you know, making use of natural substances um, in order to, in order to, um, you know, for our benefit or for our, de our design, uh, we imagine that this is kind of like a process that's, that's uh, going one direction. And, um, and of course, that's not uh, incorrect. It's not false. But what it can do is it can distract our attention or mislead us into thinking that that's the only thing that's happening. You know, because if it, if it uh, attracts our attention, it, dis it distracts our attention from anything else that might be happening. Um, if we sort of turn around and reflect on our own, uh, rather than considering the way in which we are manipulating, uh, you know, manipulating technology, what about if we pose the question in what way is technology kind of, in some ways, manipulating us? And this, uh, you know, one, one way to think about that is the way in which um, when, when we become, you know, the more we are able to restructure and, and basically wield substances, natural substances to our, to our, uh, according to our uh, designs and according to our intentions, we're able to reshape the world according to the way we uh, want to shape it. The more we do that, the more we are practicing and conditioning ourselves to uh, perceive the world in that way. What I mean by that is, the, the more we, we uh, look around at nature as a way to, and by nature I just mean anything, you know, anything that's perceptible to the senses. We look at things as uh, ways, as kind of, um, as ways of, as kind of tools as instruments, as means. Uh, this is the opposite of, you know, if I treat a, treat a person as a means, um, as a tool, as an instrument, it's clear that I am in some ways like failing to recognize this person's inherent dignity. So I'm not treating that person as a, as a you know, as a, as a person, as an, as an end. I'm treating this person as a means. Um, we are so conditioned by the technological mindset that we just, think of nature as kind of there as a standing reserve, to use Heidegger's term, just kind of like like raw material for our use. Um, and it, technology itself has actually, again, it has conditioned our perception. And so when we ask, when we pose a question, and you know, even implicitly, we just think of like, when I use the, wor the word, quote, the world, what kind of place do I think the world is? Technology and, you know, the very fact of participating in technology, it begins to answer that question for us. And we just, we start to think of the world as, uh, you know, as purely just material for our, our just a material to take advantage of and, and just kind of structure according to whatever happens to be our, you know, arbitrary whims in some ways. Um, and also just, this is uh, kind of uh, connecting this third face to the second face. Um, and specifically by, by way of the, 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 the notion of efficiency. The more, uh, you know, the more we live in the technological mindset, the more we just start to pursue efficiency for efficiency's sake. Uh, and again, by attracting our attention to how do we increase efficiency, it runs the risk of distracting our attention from uh, a more reflective and, uh, you know, in some ways more, more philosophical question of, um, what are these ends, you know, which ends are worth trying to, uh, trying to marshal our efficiency and marshal our technology towards? Like, which ends are really w valuable enough, you know, of great, uh, great enough value uh, to be worth pursuing at, at increasingly efficient rates in the first place? Um, 
And, and so again, rather than, uh, rather than answering any one of those questions, it's, it's more, um, you know, what I hope to do is, is just pose them before us. Um, but so just to, just to kind of, uh, to summarize, the, the third face of technology would be the way in which technology actually um, shapes our way of seeing, our way of looking, and then by extension, our way of seeing. And so technology actually starts to change the way we look out at the world. So I hope that with this, uh, you know, with this video that um, in this lecture, I, I hope that it's uh, helped us to uh, sort of place before us, um, you know, a, a, a much more comprehensive picture of, uh, and more, more comprehensive understanding of of uh, the elephant, so to speak, the elephant of of technology. And and then again, uh, this last this last notion of of uh, you know the, uh, the the structure and and, and conditioning. Of our perception, this I think will serve uh, neatly as a segue into um, into our next theme. Um, but so I think this is probably a good place to draw this lecture to a close, and um, I will look forward to uh, well, I wish everyone the very best, and I look forward to uh, continuing this conversation um, in the future. So um, farewell until uh, until next time. <laughs>